Hi, I'm Ibi, and you're listening to Kill the Cat. Today we're talking about Arrival, and how to make sci-fi feel real. We'll be spoiling some major plot points, so if you haven't seen the movie, it's worth watching at least once before listening to this episode. If you have seen it, then sit back and enjoy. So, today we are talking about Arrival. Yes, we're talking about Arrival very responsibly from our separate homes, because we are recording yep. this in the middle of the COVID-19 pandemic of 2020. Yes, 19 makes sense in 2020. Yeah, and we're saying our current times feel a lot stranger and more science fiction future than the movie we're going to discuss today. Yeah, Uh, The point of our podcast today, I guess, is to talk about why Arrival feels so real. Uh, I think that was one of the things when I first watched the movie, I came away feeling like, oh, that just felt really real, really emotional, really raw. It's a brilliant movie. I think the way it's been done, it feels so much more real world than probably any other sci-fi movie I can think of or that I've seen. And so we're going to talk a bit about that. But I wanted to flick over to you, Kat, to start with and talk to you about, I guess, the screenplay. Where every great movie starts and every bad movie starts. So this screenplay was adapted from a short story called The Story of Your Life. I am very impressed that someone read that and said, let's make a movie of it. Uh, (laughs) To be clear, it is a beautiful short story. It is wonderfully written. It is in no way cinematic. Um, So I'm going to talk a little bit about some changes they made um, to make it more so. Um, So the first one is, the short story is about Louise and Gary, as he's called in the short story, who becomes Ian in the script, played by Jeremy Renner. And they're basically Skyping in a room with aliens for a year. So in the screenplay, one of the first changes they made is they put them in the room with the aliens and they sped up the timeline a little bit. There's not the sense of urgency or the stakes that you feel in the film, which we'll get to. Um, And then the other major choice they made was in the short story, Louise's daughter Hannah dies in her 20s due to a rock climbing accident. And in the film, she dies of an illness. And she's, I think she's about 12. Um, And the reason for making that choice was in the short story, it's kind of implied, well, it is implied that the rock climbing accident will happen, which means everything in life that is going to happen will happen. It's a determinist outlook. And the screenwriter wanted to make it clear that Louise has a choice to have this child and that child will die no matter what. And he wanted that to be in a non-preventable way. And that's why she dies of illness. Mm. I, I remember doing a uni course um, or one of the units at uni was around uh, ideas and thought, and we had to do debates. And I remember debating determinism. Uh, so it's always a thing, it's always a topic I find very interesting. So having that in this film as well is a lot of fun. I can't remember what this is from. If anyone remembers what book this was from, let me know. But it was about like this character who ended up in the library. Oh, it was by the Anthony Horowitz. He wrote the Raven's Gate series. And a character finds a book with every choice he's ever going to make in his life. And he says, um, what's the point if it's already written? And um, I think the reply was something along the lines of, this is every choice you've ever, you're ever going to make, and you're going to make them this way, but they were made by you. That's just true. Yeah, that's not relevant. That's just a fun thing I just remembered. Anyway, <laughs> back to the screenplay of Arrival. This script had a, had a first for me. Um, this this is the first screenplay that has ever made me cry, ever. Um, and the movie didn't make me cry. Something about the way it was written, and again, talking about what we're really going to dive into today, just the humanity of it and of Louise. It's just at the end, it just hit me, like that choice to have a child you know is going to die, like possibly the worst thing a human being can go through. And then on top of that, she knows it's also going to cost her her marriage with Ian as well and choosing to do it anyway um and that was just such a bittersweet and devastating choice and the script it's about Hannah it's about a mother and her daughter it's not really about aliens or alien invasion and the last line of the script is so that is your story Hannah in some ways this choice saved the world but I'm not thinking about that Hannah I never am I'm just thinking about you yeah I think that's one of the things I really love about this film 
um, in that even though it's a sci-fi film, it's drama first. Mm. Like it's a character drama first. Uh, and it's a character drama about some good characters or like a good character. I really love uh, Louise as a character. She's not your classic sci-fi like hero, warrior or soldier or, you know, the Star Wars, like the farm boy who learns Jedi powers. She's a linguist and she works at a university and, you know, the movie kind of introduces her as this like grieving mother, which you kind of figure out what happened. Like in your second watching, you know that that's to do with the aliens rather than actually being her backstory. But it, she's like she's introduced as a very strong willed character. Um, she knows how to make decisions. She knows what she needs for her role and to do her job. And she's quite good at her job. Um, but at the same time, we also see her as she's about to go in to see the aliens, like her hands are trembling and she's dealing with anxiety around that. Um, so yeah, I just, she feels so fleshed out and so real for me. And I just, I love that. If you wanted to make a relatable character for a sci-fi film, I think this is a great way to do that. One of my favorite scenes with her is just the um, first scene with her and Colonel Weber. So she's gone into the university the day after the aliens have come. There is no one else there. And Colonel Weber appears. Basically, she's still got top secret clearance from a job she did with them beforehand. And he's that basically they need someone with top secret clearance to do this job and to help translate what the aliens are speaking or what they're saying. There's a line where he says, you know, you made quick work of those insurgent videos. And she says, you made quick work of those insurgents. Um, and we just get this instant like conflict where she's just as willing to like push back if she needs to. And then she says, she's like, I can't translate based on just this audio recording. Like I need to be there. I need to actually see them and, you know, interact. And Weber says, no, nah, I can just, I see what you're doing. And she's like, tell me what I'm doing. And he's like, no, nah, I'm not turning this into a, like a tourist thing for any academic who just wants to come along and see them. And so he threatens to walk out and she's like, fine, like I can't do the job if I can't go there. And he says, you won't get a chance if you let me walk out. And she's like, okay. And I just love that she's willing to be so firm uh, with who she is and what she needs. Yeah, and just likable characters 101. We're saying how much we love Louise as a protagonist. Make them capable. Uh, I actually think make them capable, but not. I think the term for woman is a Mary Sue. I think it could have been really easy to make her a Mary Sue, and they don't. So she's obviously, like you said, incredibly good at her job, willing to stand up for herself, very sure of herself, but put her in a room with aliens and she's shaking. And she has an amazing character introduction in the script which is just, she carries herself like someone ha who has learned to be alone, mm. which I just loved. Like, what a way to introduce a character. And I thought she contrasted really nicely with Ian, who is the physicist you also meet uh, a bit later. So one of the interactions I really love between Ian and Louise, and it's one of their first ones in the helicopter, is Ian's talking about how, you know, they're going to, they're wondering about all these science problems and physics things that the aliens would know about and louise just says how about we just talk to them first rather than throwing science problems at them and it's just again another like her just being herself and being a really strong character and even general weber uh, is very like what do they want are they here to attack us is this an invasion um and then later in the screenplay when the word weapon comes up no, like, okay, weapon, they're bad, war, fighting. And Louise is like, no, you don't understand. They might think it's a tool. They don't understand. I mean, the whole issue behind Arrival, like what we're tackling, it's not aliens invading with guns. It's not the end of the, well, it's, it could be the end of the world, but it's communication. And that is something as humans, we struggle with. It is the number one cause of most of humanity's problems. Uh, you could almost say all of it, really. One of my favorite things about this movie is that the conflict doesn't come from the aliens, as you were saying. In my notes, I've written it down as people, politics, and bureaucracy. It's the army pushing to get answers really quickly, um, people jumping to conclusions. You've got people rioting around the world and uh, the soldiers on the camp who... Uh, you know, later in the film, set a bomb to try and blow up the alien spaceship, countries not working together, people wanting to declare war. Like, that's the stuff 
that actually creates the conflict for our characters, not the aliens. They're just here to help. Yeah, I think it, it was a line in one of the drafts of the script, um, but I don't think it makes it into the final draft. Is um, Essentially, it's like, a we're here to return the favor, which is a favor that humans are going to do in the future because the aliens don't perceive time the same way. But like that's what they're here for. And just the whole study of linguistics and communication. I love how much I learned about that from watching the movie. But the idea that if you build your communication on a game, right, like Mahjong or chess, well, then all of a sudden everything is framed by competition and victory or defeat. And so, yeah, you're probably going to head towards war. One of the scenes that always sticks to me is... Uh, when she writes up, like, what is your purpose? Like, that's what you want to figure out in the end. Well, first we need to know, do they know what a question is? Just starting with that very basic. Mm. And then it's, do they understand the difference between a singular and collective your? And then do they know what a purpose is? Or are they instinctual? Like, there's all these questions you have to deal with. Um, And it's like, Louise has to constantly defend how she's acting Um, And Weber eventually, I think he kind of sides with her a bit more, but she's constantly fighting people who just don't get that processes take time. And I think that's another one of the things that is really a key for this movie is that it's just about the time that these processes take um, and like how long you actually need to communicate well. And General Weber, when he walks in, he hands her a recording and says, translate it. Um, They were talking before. And then... It takes some convincing to be like, no, I have to be in the room with them. And it takes even more convincing to be like, I can't just ask them, what is the purpose? I have to do this. I have to teach them Ian walks. I have to teach them like verbs. Um, And just even that simple thing of when she takes her mask off for the first time, they have to see me. Um, And after that, that wonderful line, which was in every trailer, which is now that's a proper introduction. Honestly, if you're a screenwriter and you're listening to this, Go read Arrival. It is a wonderful example of how to have a very personal descriptive script while keeping um, action lines very short and to the point. So it just has these wonderful lines in it, like one of the like description lines, like the skin of the lake is a cloudy mirror was one. Um, And describing the alien language is an ink blot coffee cup stain with mesmerizing fractal embellishments. And when I listened to an interview with the screenwriter, um, he said, I wanted to do the best description in haiku, which I think is the most wonderful way to describe action lines and screenplays. So we have this science fiction film, very human in its relationships, its characters, its themes, but also the way they decided to shoot it and design it makes it feel incredibly grounded in our reality. Mm. One of the things that sort of brought me back to Arrival was an interview I saw with Bradford Young, who was the DP for the film, uh, just talking about his approach to lighting. And he's a DP who I love and have sort of been following for a little while. But his whole approach on the film was to try and use as much practical light, as much available light, as much natural light as possible. So... When you're in Louise's house, the light is just the light coming in through the window. When you're in the um, military tents, you've got fluorescent lights hanging and you've got lanterns in... uh, There's one of the hallways in that tent where there's just a bunch of lanterns and that's what they're being lit with. And, you know, we live in an era where cameras can do that and uh, you can sort of have less light there for your film. But, yeah, everything was just kept so natural And uh, I think that really adds to the film because you feel that nothing feels fake. Um, When you go into the alien ship, the light that they used was just they literally hung up a massive white curtain and just shot a bunch of lights through that to match what was there actually uh, in the story, which was the, you know, alien side, which was this glowing white wall, essentially. Watching an interview with uh, Denis Villeneuve, uh, I think is how you pronounce his name, not Denis Villeneuve, as I used to say it. (laughs) Uh, But um, he talks about the approach they took to their production design and um, the idea of just using mundane items. Yeah, and um, 
the choice they made as well to not use any technology that didn't currently exist. So when you have like that room of all the people on monitors, none of the technology is futuristic. It is all stuff that existed at the time. The suits they're wearing, they're quite clunky. They use a scissor lift yes. to get up to the air. And it's like, okay, they need to get 20 feet into the air. What would you use? Well, you'd use a scissor lift. There's even a line in the script where they're on the truck going towards um, the ship. And the production design there is described as bench seating has been set up, but it all feels a bit cobbled together. And I think that did make it into the film. It does feel like they've just thrown up what they can, like the military tents. And they're doing, yeah, they're doing the best they can. Um, And we're seeing some of that in the real world right now with COVID-19. The hospitals that got just put up in China because they just needed more beds. It's what it's like. It's what happens. It's real. Yeah. Like in the film, the trucks are driving, they're white utes. Normally when you're watching a sci-fi film, everyone who's from a government agency is driving around in black vans or black SUVs. Like that's the thing. But no, it's white utes. It's laptops. It's trestle tables. It's, Mm. yeah, it's it's exactly that. It's this portable ramshackle chucked together with what was on hand kind of set up. And it just adds to that feeling of like, this is a real thing. And this is kind of actually much more accurate to how it would look if we did go through this. I think that adds to, so there are some images in the film, which is so surreal. I think contrasting that with this very realistic production design and natural lighting setup. So I think the very first one is just a helicopter landing outside Louise's house. She's got a glass of wine, it's an everyday, and just this helicopter appears and lands outside her house. And it gets steadily more surreal. The first, like, really out there one is when they start walking up the wall to get to the aliens. The surreal nature of it all. Like you said, the first time Louise meets them, she comes out, she's shaking, Ian's laughing, and then he throws up, which is also, like, in another, like, very, very human reaction. And then I also think the last thing that really adds to that is just the speed that everything happens at Webb is at her house then she's in a helicopter then she's at the base and then the doors only open I think every 18 hours so they have to go and the window is about to open and they've got to get to the window and they're just like rush rush and then she's in there she doesn't get a chance to catch her breath and neither do we yeah when they arrive at the base they are instantly put in for a medical examination and uh, like all like they're given like every vaccine you can possibly be given and that's all just happening so quickly and they've barely got time to think before they're they've got another question and then an alarm goes off and it's like oh what's that that's the 15 minute warning so they've got 15 minutes before suddenly they're actually going in to see the aliens Um, and it's just this relentless like time push for them Yeah, and they don't get a chance to breathe and the script does not slow down until we've seen the aliens. It just rushes up into that point, first introduction. Then it's Ian and Louise kind of a bit freaked out afterwards. That's kind of when the pace slows down for the first time. But they, yeah, it's very fast paced from there are aliens too, let's see them. Um, But yeah, let's, let's talk about the aliens, like talking about this very real approach to the film and then having these completely surreal aliens. You put it nicely. Yeah, I, I put it as um, like having truly alien aliens. Yeah. Uh, I think, you know, when you look at aliens in most sci-fi films, right, like if you pull up Alien or any of the comic book movies or um, Star Wars even, like aliens are just weird looking humans, really, like They work like us in that they have languages that are written and spoken. They're usually bipedal. Um, They have mouths and eyes. Maybe they have an extra limb or something. But typically they either they look very much like us or they just look like monsters and they're like instinctual creatures that will just eat you. (laughs) Um, And so I think the idea of having these aliens... Um, and uh, the screenwriter and director both talk about kind of having this inspiration of like it's sort of the deep sea creatures, just these things that are so foreign to us, right? Like they have seven legs and they kind of float around in their thing, but they can also seemingly walk on the legs and, um, you know, they don't talk like us. They 
experience time differently. The way they write is, um, I don't remember the phrase for it, but it's essentially like a style of writing where um, there is no like back or front. Like we write left to right, but if you were to read and write Arabic, you'd go from right to left. But for them, there is no backwards or forwards. It's like you could start writing with both hands and meet in the middle and finish the phrase. So there's just all these things that are so alien to us. And I think that actually adds to the reality because that's more likely what they would be, right? Like it's something so far removed from us that we kind of have to go, yeah, well, wow. Okay. That's, that's alien. Yeah. And then breaking down the challenge, which is the biggest challenge in the script is not how do we beat these guys? How do we fight them? How do we outsmart them? It's how do we understand them? Which again, as history shows us, humans aren't great at doing. Um, always. Hardly ever. And even in the movie, they're not great at doing, right? Like in the end, the aliens have managed to give a few people and or I sort of took away that a few people had gotten the message, but Louise is kind of placed as like the main person who gets the language. But like it is really not many people who do come away having understood them or being have been successful in the communication. Like most of the world is ready to blow them up uh, or, you know, try to and probably fail. Or, yeah, or take what the aliens are offering for themselves and not share it with the rest of them, which of course they can't because they're giving it to the world in 12 pieces. Um, so pieces are useless on their own. One of the other things that I think, uh, you know, it's a small point, but it ends up being big is um, just the choice location for the aliens. Like, they don't land above the White House, like in Independence Day or above the Eiffel Tower or anything like that. They land in a field in, I think it's Minnesota. They land in sort of these weird spaces that are not connected in any way. Like someone, I think there's a line in the script about how there was like, there was a band that had like a hit song in each of those countries, <laughs> but that's probably a stretch. Um, yeah, they. it's like the aliens are not aware of our culture or who we are. Or find what we find important, important. Yeah. One of the things I like with that is that they still have complex motivations. Um, Again, they're not, you know, sort of the monster aliens where they're just, ah, they're going to eat us. Like we're able to get to a point in the movie where we connect with them enough that we understand they're here for a reason um, and they are a lot smarter than us. Uh, and I think it's this balance that the movie walks really well um, that just, I don't know, for me, added to the realism of it. Yeah, and I loved how the aliens themselves aren't a threat, but at the same time the the film is full of threats. There are definite stakes here and you feel it. Even just early on, that shot of them walking up the wall in the ship. Uh, and I think someone even says that they can drop, like they can change this at any time and they can like blast us out and we will essentially fall to our deaths. Yeah, I remember just watching that um, and just getting goosebumps because the idea of walking up a wall with nothing to support you and however many feet to the ground below i don't really like heights so that really got to me yeah. um there's the um there's the opening shot of that as well is they are walking upside down if the first shot you see in the spaceship is flipped upside down um i want to imagine that that was something they found in the edit because mm -hmm. uh, that would just be a like great story of like editor going hmm what if we did this um because it does it adds to that tension and that unease of like oh gosh we are like not in a fun place right now and as if that wasn't threatening enough one of the first things louise sees when she goes into the aliens is they they've got a canary uh the canary in the coal mine and that immediately puts thoughts into your heads of like suffocation or radiation or there's something in the air that they shouldn't be breathing and the entire first interaction they have with the aliens that entire session the canary is going off in the background. Like you hear it yeah. chirping the entire way through. And the music as well, uh, which is another thing. This oh, this movie has such a gorgeous score. Mm. Um, the score itself is very, very alien, which I thought was a really interesting choice. Even above the more realistic scenes of the office and the military base, the score sounds 
alien. It has these very scary horns in it. I don't know if horns is the right word. It's not like Inception horns, but it's that noise you hear. And one, once you think about it, you'll never unhear it when you watch the film, but it's like the first noise when you hear the aliens. And it's a really, really terrifying, loud horn. The piece in the score, if, if you want to hear what I'm talking about, um, the track is called First Encounter. It's a scary piece of music. Yeah, I love, um, this is moving slightly away, but reminded me through the music, um, the opening scene, the evacuation, uh, is another one of those scenes that is just very surreal. Um, and there's no music during it. Um, which I think was a perfect choice because it just allows everything to run out. Um, so there's that scene where everyone's leaving the uni, everyone's going to like their cars. Um, there's like two people, like there's, there's a fender bender up in the car park as Louise is walking to her car. And all you have is just jets flying overhead. Um, yeah. And then in the, in the script, there's a line that's like, she's walking to her car off screen she hears a car crash and then she just keeps going which is how it happens and living in sydney in 2019 2020 we've experienced this firsthand not just with covid but with bushfires and with flooding and with drought you hear these things on the news and you know it's serious and then you go about your day because you have to which is like is exactly what louise is doing Mm. when colonel weber comes to see her for the first time she's grading term papers yeah One of the other things I think is really, I find it, uh, I'm not sure how I feel about it. I think it was a good choice, uh, but normally I would be like, oh, it's such a cliche. But all of the exposition we get about what's happening in the world comes to us through news stories. Is people watching the news or listening to the news on radio? Um, Like we get so much uh, information through the news about like, Um, One of the first ones we hear is like there's borders are closed and there's flights cancelled and they've put a ban on gun licenses um, and they've lifted emergency service overtime restrictions. Uh, And then it's, you know, people are starting to riot and loot. And then, you know, it's two months later and um, there's still like lockdowns around the place. Um, And, you know, then we start hearing a lot about China and what their response is and, Um, You know, the fact that they've heard the word weapon comes to us from the news, not from the military. Um, And at times the military are a little bit behind in terms of world news. Yeah. And actually one of the things I was so impressed with in this film is that the stakes, the stakes are actually what a lot of classic action and in sci-fi films are. The world could end, but it's not aliens are going to blow us up and you could go plug something in a USB port and the action hero is going to go and stop the world blowing up and kill all the aliens. None of that ever feels real because you know the hero is going to win. Yeah. And I think for Arrival, just watching it play out, and we touched on themes of communication earlier, it, it really feels like this could be the way the world goes. If something like this were to happen, we could just stop talking to each other. Yeah, we'd kill ourselves. Yeah. As in humanity would destroy itself before the aliens destroyed us. And Louise saves the world, essentially. There's no MacGuffin, there's no bomb to stop, there's no alien to kill. She picks up the phone and she has a conversation. Yeah. That's it, that saves the world. Something so simple and human and mundane. But yeah, it just goes back to that incredibly human message, uh, one that we probably don't get enough, which is listen to each other, understand each other, take the time to understand each other, take the time to understand people who are different to you. Yeah. Um, Yeah, and I think that's something we all fail at often um and to have the fate of the world riding on that is a very very scary and real and human thing that's probably one of the most real things that we're getting from the sci-fi film right in terms of what makes this feel real is that the threat is the most real threat and it's a thing we know all too much about is that yeah it's humanity which is a really interesting thing and it's yeah one of the best parts of this film it makes you think makes you consider yourself um, beyond just like think about like how you would react in Louise's situation is just how you would react to aliens. And I think it's rare that you get a sci-fi film that makes you think in that kind of way. Yeah. And that's what good sci-fi really should be. It shouldn't like it's fun to theorize about what kind of technology and stuff we're going to have in the future. And it's fun to have big space battles and all that. But good sci-fi is intended to exist to make us look at the present and make us look at problems 
in the present, examined in a futuristic setting. Mm. Yeah. All right. So, Kat, what are you going to take away from this film in terms of your writing? Well, I think one of the highest honours is if you can make the person who's reading your work cry. I think you've done a good job. I think the only harder thing to do is to make someone laugh. Um, So how do you do that? Um, Especially in a sci-fi film. I think a lot of sci-fi films begin with a concept. That's totally fine. Something like Minority Report or The Matrix, you probably start with the scientific concept and how that works and how that world might work. But then no matter how cool that concept is, it doesn't matter unless you have a human story at the center. This film begins with a montage of Hannah and it ends with a montage of Hannah. It's a story about a mother who loves and is gonna lose her daughter, which is incredibly powerful. And it's a story about humanity and how we talk to each other and how we understand each other and it uses the sci-fi setting and it uses aliens to comment on how we do and how we should talk to each other so my big takeaway is just where's the humanity what message are you trying to send Mm. I think I'll jump on that as well I think in terms of directing and looking at story yeah like how do you find the humanity Uh, especially in a sci-fi story because as this movie goes to show like you can have a deeply deeply emotional science fiction story uh, that is tense and has high stakes and is interesting and makes you think i think denis villanueva is a flipping genius i've been watching a bunch of his films lately and just like blown away by everything the guy does but yeah i think the other thing for me probably more practically and directly is um around the cinematography and even production design. I think just those notes of like using the mundane things and using natural light and using what's around uh, in a sci-fi setting, it's kind of this very interesting juxtaposition to what we are used to and what we would expect. You know, Uh, I was watching The Avengers and it's set in the same year that this movie is set, but they've got like holographic screens (laughs) and, you know, and I know it's it's a different genre of sci-fi, but it's like the difference is huge. And so it, you kind of feel it when you have this very real and naturalistic kind of sci-fi. I think even for like near future things, I'd be so interested to see like what would be the take on sci-fi, you know, based in like 2050, where the technology hasn't actually evolved all that much. Um, and how do you make a story out of that? So, yeah, keeping things real. How do you do that? That's my takeaway. All right. Well, I think I think we communicated very well about Arrival. I hope so. <laughs> so we learned something from the movie, hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Until next time. Until next time. Stay safe. Stay isolated. Wash your hands. <laughs> <laughs>